Thank you, Trevor, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful place uh, with this interested audience. Um, I hope that uh, you are not too tired after last night and that you feel up to some in vivo imaging. So, um, so far you have heard Trevor speak about, it gives you an overview uh, of different systems, including the certainergic ones. Russian Kuhls talked about uh, human decision making and cognition. And, and Sarah Kmenin uh, about adaptive uh, behavior and James about the regulation of inhibitory uh, control. But uh, serotonin uh, actually does many, many other things that we haven't touched upon. And that includes uh, regulation of uh, food intake, appetite, uh, reward, um, cognition we have covered, sexual functions, aggression, mood, uh, seasonality, and sleep, plus uh, a number of other functions, but these are some of the most prominent ones. So um, what I will cover mainly in this first part of my talk is uh, uh, these uh, three things at the bottom, seasonality, mood, and aggression. Uh, these are things that we have studied in humans, but taken advantage of for the knowledge we have from animal studies. So I think it's very important always to try to keep in mind what do we know uh, based on animal studies and how can we transfer that to the clinical studies, but also the back translation is very important that you, if you work with animal um, or preclinical studies, that you actually look at the human literature and try to understand uh, what, what's really going on there. So um, this is an overview of what I plan to talk to you about in this first part. I'll talk about the new imaging of the serotonin system and then I'll talk about uh, these three types of uh, disorders that are thought to be uh, tightly regulated by uh, serotonin. Um, so uh, functional brain imaging uh, can cover various aspects and uh, we're here uh, at this summer school uh, with the chemical uh, modulation and neurotransmission and for that purpose to do in vivo imaging of uh, these systems uh, we need to use PET for uh, in vivo clinical studies. This is all we have at the moment and perhaps SPECT could be added as well. But that we have fewer ligands for, for SPECT. Uh, so the neurotransmission and receptor activation leads to neuronal activity that can be captured with uh, measures such as EEG and MEG because we have fast uh, action potentials that lead to electrical signals. Um, that in turn leads to changes in energy consumption and glucose metabolism, which we can measure uh, mainly with PET, but we can also get a proxy from doing functional MRI uh, and uh, thereby get an idea about how blood flow is changing. So since metabolism and blood flow generally are, uh, are tightly correlated in the brain, uh, that's how MRI comes into play. And then finally, um, the uh, changes in the energy consumption would lead to changes in the blood flow, as I just mentioned here. And that is what we capture with the hemodynamic response, also called the bold response. So at this lecture, I will mainly cover PET and MRI. And I'll also talk about how we now can actually do simultaneous uh, measurements of PET and MRI and how that can assist us in understanding uh, what is going on in the brain, but also it can also help uh, and assist us to uh, develop novel compounds and, and understand how they work. So just very basic, uh, for those of you who are maybe not so familiar here, we have an MRI scanner. Uh, you can do uh, some activation studies and you can do some modeling and quantification, which can lead you to uh, some nice images of uh, where you see changes uh, in blood flow uh, in response to, say, a given paradigm. You can also do a more static measurement with a technique called uh, arterial spin labeling that allows you to uh, investigate uh, more, um, I would say, semi-chronic changes in blood flow so that you can capture over longer time points. With the PET, uh, we uh, use uh, the positron uh, emission. I'll discuss, I'll discuss this more in detail in the second part of my talk and, and get more technical when it gets to that. So basically, uh, let me just return. So basically what it allows you to is to compare 
uh, for instance, uh, a given drug action in the brain and how it affects uh, the occupancy of uh, receptors in the brain that this particular compound is targeting. We don't need to spend much time here. You all know that the serotonin system is built up with the RAFE, with projections all over the brain, that we have the presynaptic location of the serotonin transporter, and we have uh, 14 postsynaptic um, serotonin uh, receptor subtypes. Uh, now, how many of these can we image? Well, we have today, we have five, perhaps six uh, different ways, uh, targets that we can image with PET. Uh, here you can see uh, the serotonin transporter, the 1A, 1B, 2A, and 4, and possibly uh, we do have also uh, a radioligand for the 5HT6, although it's not uh, overly specific, so I have not included it here. And what you can see is that uh, the receptors have a, a characteristic distribution that varies from receptor to receptor. And um, <clears throat> this um, also shows that, I think um, Mark showed you uh, an image yesterday where he showed the diversity and the complexity of the serotonin transmitter system, which is further augmented by all these different uh, receptors that can uh, interact in different ways. So, uh, so these uh, images basically show you an outcome of the PET imaging, which is called the binding potential. And the binding potential is uh, derived from this equation you see here in the bottom. So it's the free fraction in the brain tissue times the density of the protein, the receptor protein, times the affinity of the radioligand to the uh, protein. And this means that when you get these nice images, as I just showed you before with all the pretty colors, um, you have an idea about where you are, but actually you can't really know for a fact, sorry, if, if you see differences or changes, whether it's due to the affinity. For instance, if you have group differences, could you have uh, differences in the affinity from person to person, or could you have differences in the uh, free fraction? <clears throat> so what we recently did was to take uh, 210 healthy <coughs> subjects that we had stored in a database and acquired uh, over many years, acquired with a high-resolution uh, research tomograph, uh, which has a resolution of a couple of millimeters, and then align it to high-resolution uh, structural images with MRI, and uh, then define uh, different regions. And what you can see, for instance, on this slide is that we have all the binding potentials for the serotonin transporter ligand, DASB. And uh, we compared it to uh, data in the literature where people had taken post-mortem brains out and quantified uh, the protein density. So uh, what you can see is that generally we see a decent correlation between post-mortem data uh, in different regions and our binding potential. Uh, and um, you can see also in the RAFE here for the serotonin transporter and the 5-HT1A, it is a bit off, but that's because we're not doing a great job in very small regions with very high density. So we are underestimating uh, the RAFE uh, density, the RAFE serotonin transporter density in this region, and likewise for 1B or 1A. Um, and, um, these plots uh, actually allows us to calibrate the PET signal. So now we can convert these BPND values down here uh, into uh, real protein densities. And uh, then you get an image that look, looks like this. And you can see that the ranges down here are vastly different. Uh, and um, this means that, um, for instance, we have plenty of 5 ht 2 a receptors uh, compared to the 5-HT4 um, receptor. Uh, and, uh, and this actually allows you to uh, give a, an overall view of how do these different uh, receptors and transporters distribute in different brain regions. And uh, this is a, a nice tool because you can now, you can go whenever you have uh, a, a question about what is the relative proportion in this brain region, what can I expect? You can go back and you can find uh, these uh, data. The atlas is on the internet and it's freely available uh, for use uh, just for comparisons. <clears throat> Another thing we did with the same data set was to compare the protein density maps that we had generated in this way 
and then uh, to uh, look at mRNA levels uh, as we could find them in the uh, Allen Brain Atlas. Uh, and Allen Brain Atlas is an atlas where they uh, uh, very meticulously uh, uh, identified uh, the concentration of mRNA uh, in different uh, post-mortem brains, uh, five brains to be accurate. And uh, then we could again compare the density to the mRNA. And what you see here is uh, some quite striking differences between the different receptor systems. Maybe it's not overly surprising that it's not always that mRNA expression equals protein density. I think we all know that inherently. But still, um, many times when you read the literature, people uh, assume that the mRNA is uh, equal to the uh, protein density. But in the brain, where you often have uh, the, um, the, um, the uh, soma of uh, the neuron in a completely different place to where the receptor is actually expressed, then you can see uh, funny things happening. And for instance, you can look at the 5-HC2A receptors here. You can see that in new cortex, uh, it's nicely and tightly correlated, but it doesn't have an intercept uh, at zero. Uh, and you see that subcortical areas uh, behave quite differently. So again, this is a map you can use, uh, and now you can estimate uh, in a given brain region what would be uh, the mRNA in that particular region. Okay, so um, what do we know about genetics and uh, and receptors. I mean, in this room, probably, uh, there might be even a factor of two between the density of receptors in my brain compared to, to your brain. Uh, so the inter-individual variability is very, very high. And, um, and the question then arises, so what, what is determining these inter-individual differences that also make it a little, it makes it a little difficult to do group analysis because of this large uh, inter-individual variation. And uh, of course, twin studies, uh, as always, is uh, very informative, and they can tell us to what extent uh, is uh, identity is uh, hereditary and genetically determined. And this is a study we did some years back um, where we compared monozygotic twin pairs to dizygotic twin pairs. And as you can see, which is quite obvious, uh, the pairs of uh, monozygotic twins' brains um, shows that uh, they are actually quite identical as compared to the dizygotic uh, twin pairs. And if you plot the uh, different brain regions and you compare, if you take the same person and scan that person twice, uh, you get an, an intercorrelation coefficient of about uh, 0.92, which is close to one, which means identity. And I think the, re the, the reason that it's not 1.0 could be that either we have some methodological issues with noise, or it could also be that actually our receptor levels are maybe not constant. And this is often when we do these PET studies, we have a kind of an assumption that each person has constant receptor levels and that they're not really modulated to any major extent. But uh, I think that slowly um, we are understanding now that that might not uh, be the case, that it's way more dynamic than we thought. But still, when you do a test retest, you get pretty close to unity line, as you would expect. And also, when you study uh, the identical twins here, you can see that they seem to cluster quite tightly around the unity line. Uh, whereas if you go to the dizygotic twins, you can clearly see that there is more of a spread and if you go to unrelated individuals, that spread might be slightly larger still. But I mean, we still have a preserved distribution across brain regions. That's not the question. It's more the absolute levels. How do they change? And other people uh, here at the Karolinska have uh, looked at the heritability of the D2, D3 receptors. And here you can see in the upper panels for the D2, D3 receptors, in the monozygotic twins, uh, we have a very high ICC, and that goes uh, down a bit compared uh, to the monozygotic when you look at the dizygotic twins. And, and likewise uh, for the uh, 5HC1A receptor. So it seems to be a general thing that uh, the uh, receptor densities that we are equipped with are, are genetically uh, determined to a large extent at least. <coughs> 
So um, oftentimes we would really like to know what is the serotonin level uh, in the brain in people. Uh, and uh, so far we have not been overly successful in determining uh, a good method for uh, assessing serotonin levels uh, in the brain. So a number of different uh, methodologies have been applied uh, and you can see the different ones here. So when you sleep, we have changes, so that could be one way of changing serotonin levels. Uh, uh, the cerebral sp spinal fluid measurements, uh, metabolites, is, an, is a different way of doing it. Uh, we know that serotonin is rapidly metabolized uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid, so you can only look at the metabolites uh, with some certainty. So um, it would be very nice to have uh, a, an in vivo measure of serotonin levels in the brain. And um, uh, there is uh, some uh, animal literature out there suggesting that uh, when you have changes in serotonin levels in the brain, either pharmacologically induced or induced otherwise, then uh, the receptors respond in a certain way. Uh, and for instance, the serotonin transporter has this interesting uh, inverted U-shaped association to the serotonin transporter. Uh, uh, we also see uh, this uh, um, relationship with the 5-HT2A so that it goes down uh, at very low concentration, but at uh, intermediate or, or at low uh, concentrations, if this is normality, uh, then it increases. <clears throat> but the 5-HT4 seems to have a nice inverse relationship uh, with serotonin levels. And uh, that's why we set out, uh, because of that and because of some initial animal studies conducted uh, different places, we could see that when you had knockouts, if you had pharmacological interventions, uh, it seemed like the 5-HT4 receptor was a good candidate for uh, measuring uh, endogenous serotonin levels. And, um, and this was uh, later confirmed in some, uh, some clinical studies where uh, genetic uh, differences uh, um, could uh, also reveal differences in the 5-HT4 receptor, um, for instance, differences in the serotonin transporter gene. So then uh, we set out to do a, a uh, um, multimodal neuroimaging project where we took uh, 32 healthy males and we um, as, uh, randomized them into two groups, either one that was to receive fluoxetine for three weeks uh, or placebo for uh, three weeks. And the reason we chose three weeks was, first of all, that the animal studies suggest that acute changes in serotonin uh, does not uh, modify 5-HT4. You need to have more sustained changes uh, in serotonin in order to pick up uh, these differences. And what we did was to look uh, at uh, the bold fMRI response to uh, faces. Emotional faces is a very strong elicitor of uh, the bold response in amygdala. And, um, and uh, I'll get back to that later. And we also uh, did 5-HT4 receptor binding with uh, this tracer. And what we found was that when we looked at a, a ratio across uh, different brain regions, that generally when we administered fluoxetine, we could see that uh, the um, ratio, which should be one uh, if no changes happened, uh, was decreased. So we had lower 5-HT4 binding when we had higher uh, 5-HT. Uh, and uh, the placebo group uh, didn't uh, change much. <clears throat> so what happened when we looked at the fMRI response, we would have expected that in response to the SSRI fluoxetine, we would have an increase in serotonin. And that increase would lead to less amygdala activation to aversive faces. Uh, so to, somewhat to our surprise, we were unable to replicate uh, this finding that has been reported from other labs that if you have an intervention group and a placebo group, you do see a decrease in, uh, in amygdala activation. Now, this is not any surprise. I should say, maybe this is a good time, that replications in neuroimaging, as in any other neuroscience uh, discipline, is something that you always have to look for. And, uh, and I think it's very, very important to keep this in mind that whenever you do have findings, then always try to see if you can replicate your findings because it's, we have 
too many results out there that are confusing. I'll get a little bit back to that later on when we start to talk about uh, major depression. So uh, this was uh, slightly surprising to us. However, we did have our other measure, the PET-based measure of uh, serotonin changes. How about that? Would we be able to tease out an association between uh, our, uh, our serotonin um, proxy and uh, the um, uh, amygdala activation? And actually, we did. So uh, when uh, we looked at people uh, who had increased uh, their serotonin levels compared to their baseline, we could see that uh, they had a low uh, amygdala reactivity, whereas those people who spontaneously or for other reason uh, seem to have lowered their serotonin levels since their original examination, uh, they had uh, in an increased amygdala reactivity. So this is an example of a multimodality project where you can use one modality to inform you about the analysis uh, of your other, um, your, of your fMRI, in this case, fMRI study. So, um, if we move on to uh, the affective disorders, um, how can we uh, study these uh, affective disorders? One very obvious way, of course, is to look at healthy people versus depressed. Um, Another uh, viable way, I think, would be to instead study uh, people who were at risk, uh, either people who uh, were susceptible to develop uh, affective disorders, or perhaps also more interesting, resilience uh, to uh, affective disorders. Because if we know the factors of resilience, that might actually be helpful for us to understand how can we support people that actually do get affective disorders and what is the underlying biology. So that's very informative to know about resilience. Well, uh, going back to the top. Yes? How do, how do you diagnose resilience? How do you find people that are resilient to depression? Because obviously they're not going to the doctor. Yeah, exactly. So how do you define resilience? Um, resilience could, for instance, be to take people, I'll, I'll, I think I might have an example later. So, for instance, we know that the personality um, trait neuroticism, um, which I'll get back to later what that is, um, is something that is predisposing you for developing depression. We know that there are uh, certain genetic subtypes that also predispose you uh, to a depression. You can do twin studies where you have one twin that has depression, another twin does not. What makes this twin resilient to depression in spite of the familiar predisposition. So it's not something you just go out and do and you don't find them at the doctor, but it's people that you have to, you know, find in other ways. Um, uh, females are also more prone to depression than males. So, I mean, you could, you could put all these things together and then you can actually identify these people and you can try to understand what makes these people resilient. Um, so, um, we can look at behavior. How do people respond to, say, a, a questionnaire, uh, a new psychological uh, test um, of, with emotional content? Uh, and you can try to uh, <coughs> use different serotonergic acting drugs. Trevor also, I think, spoke briefly about, no, it was James who spoke about acute tryptophan depletion, where you take a diet, you take a drink, which is depleted of the precursor to uh, serotonin, which is tryptophan. Uh, and then you will see gradually over the next five hours, your tryptophan levels will drop in the blood and the synthesis in the brain uh, will um, decrease. That's the, the idea, at least behind the acute tryptophan depletion. And um, you can also do some MR-based neuroimaging. Uh, you can do functional, you can do resting state. Um, how many of you know what resting state uh, functional MRI? So maybe I should just explain a little bit. So um, resting state, so the brain is always having small uh, oscillations and these oscillations vary from brain region to brain region. And when you do resting state connectivity, you investigate uh, which areas are in synchrony. And right now you are attentive, you are awake, so your default mode network is probably not operating uh, quite as much as it would otherwise. 
If you're put in a scanner and asked to think about nothing, whatever that is, you're always thinking about something. But if you're put in a scanner and asked just to think about nothing, what you can see is a very specific pattern called the default mode network. And that might actually also be uh, one feature that distinguishes people with affective disorders from non-affective disorders. You can also do pharmacological uh, MRI. You can study healthy versus at risk versus depressed. You can look at genetic associations and you can also look at serotonergic um, interventions. So all these, these uh, ways of studying uh, serotonergic neurotransmission with different modalities is what we have at hand. And that has been intensively studied in major depressive disorder. Uh, you can see here how uh, the number of studies is, uh, uh, is growing. I mean, it seems to be pretty constant for the PET, uh, but we have a growing uh, MR literature on the topic. Um, and this is uh, split up in uh, the MRI and the PET. So uh, again, there's a, a quite a bulk of literature out there describing uh, what happens in major depressive disorder. So um, what do they tell you all these studies? Do we have any information about what's going on? Um, let's just take a quick look. This is a review that was published uh, a few years back. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was basically listing uh, all the studies that at that time had been done. And you can't read it, and that's not the idea. What I just want to show you is that there is uh, a large number of studies. And if you look at the outcomes, um, uh, you can see, uh, well, maybe you can't see that, but I'll tell you that the outcomes have uh, been quite confusing. So some people find that the binding potentials go up, others find that they go down. We have uh, a fairly large um, um, laboratory that has conducted the many, many uh, subjects. You can also see that uh, the number of subjects is not always that high because PET is expensive. and uh, then people think that if it's expensive, then you can't do many, but uh, so they do few, but then the conclusions are a little bit harder to, uh, to rely on, of course. Uh, but, but the laboratory that has conducted uh, most uh, patients, I would think, uh, they have reported that if they use one way of quantification, they see an increase. Do they use another way of quantification, uh, they see a decrease. So, um, I think uh, that is quite confusing, and how do we communicate this properly to the, uh, the um, new science community and to clinicians? What is it we are really finding? And um, I'll continue this disappointing uh, <laughs> listing of uh, conflicting outcomes. This is 5HT2A receptors in mood disorders. Again, uh, quite some uh, conflicting uh, outcomes. Um, uh, and this applies for the serotonin transporter as well. So um, why do we have all these different answers? Uh, and uh, how come that we can't come up with that solid conclusion? This is one disease and we are very careful. We follow all the clinical, uh, the, uh, the, the clinical criteria for depression. And uh, it's, it's great people who do the work. And how come that it's all so messy? Well, I think uh, it, it could have uh, different answers or maybe combinations of answers. Uh, uh, maybe the radioligand are not specific enough for uh, the protein that we are interested in. Uh, I definitely think that the statistical power of many PET studies uh, is insufficient to address the question. Uh, and actually, what I think might be the most important reason is the disease heterogeneity because somebody has calculated that with the current criteria, you can actually be depressed in 945 different ways. That's, that's pretty depressive to know, isn't it? So, so, I mean, you can either eat more and you can eat less, you can sleep more, you can sleep less, uh, and so on. I could just go on. So, I mean, depressive symptoms, uh, it's quite clearly defined, but it's all symptoms, so uh, maybe they are just what we look at when we see a depressed patient is just uh, one disease, one single disease. And that's why I think the avenue to understand better what is, what is the neurobiology between this disease is to also define disease heterogeneity or maybe to understand what is resilience. Um, of course, we know that there is uh, 
uh, a large population heterogeneity. I started out telling you about uh, the genetic differences and how individual variability is quite prominent. And uh, that for sure is also going to make it harder for us to compare across groups because if the variation is very big uh, in both groups, then uh, you just need to have many, many more. Yes. Uh, you can only do one receptor uh, imaging at a time. Um, you need to do them separately if you want to do more. Yes? How many studies, in terms of that spatial population, is it just from a diagnosis like a clinical diagnosis point of view, or is there something else that you can do to make the diagnosis more accurate? Because it's not just the clinical diagnosis, it's the No, you have some clinical criteria that people have to meet. Sure, but I guess what I mean is in terms of the actual study. Yes. You know, they have a patient population. They just do the... Oh, you mean if they take any measures? Yeah. No, I think, I think most of the people who, who run these studies, they are psychiatrists themselves. And, and so they would do a, more, a way more meticulous examination than they would in a regular patient. Um, so uh, most psychiatrists would not care to sit with all the criteria. They are, I mean, they're, they're experienced, they're, clinic, they're clinicians, and they know what a depression looks like when they see one. Uh, but there are uh, different ways whereby you can try to quantify the degree of uh, depression. And, and there are some uh, rating scales that people can use. Uh, and, um, and, and those rating scales, of course, you, you need to define all these things uh, when you start out. So you need to have in and exclusion criteria. And James also mentioned that briefly the other day that uh, maybe if you have very strict in and exclusion criteria, you can only, you know, maybe use one out of 10 people. And, and we're currently running a project about uh, response, uh, prediction of response to SSRIs. And and here the problem is if you have a number of examinations that you want to take these depressive subjects through, um, are we then picking you know, a subgroup of depressed individuals that is not representative for the disease as such? I mean, you have to choose to some extent how narrow do you want to be? And the more narrow you get, um, maybe it's easier for you to get a viable um, answer to, to, to your findings. But at the same time, you can't generalize to the rest of the population. And that's always a trade-off that you need to make. How strict do I want to be uh, in my criteria? And that actually also applies to when you do uh, uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, so most of us tend to use students because students, uh, university students are interested in joining. They want to see their brains and they are eager to know more about themselves. Um, but what is much harder uh, for us to find would be people who have a lower IQs, people who do not have a long education. So in a certain sense, what we're looking at is a super healthy uh, population. And that's, that applies, I think, to many of us that it's hard to get uh, a representative sample. Yes? That's, that's a very interesting proposal that you're making here. And what you are, if I understand you correctly, what you are basically suggesting is that could you instead examine a large number of patients? Maybe you need to do that as a multicenter, and you would definitely need uh, a lot of funding to do that. But could you instead do that? And then you could go the other way and say, given that I have these outcomes in this population of depressed subjects, could I identify certain features uh, in my outcome measures, my neuroimaging measures, that would be predictive of, say, who is going to respond to SSRIs, who is going to um, improve, who doesn't actually have a, a regular depression, but something else. Uh, and, and that's another interesting way, but, but it's surprisingly that it's actually just more recently that people have started to think in this reverted way and I think what the reason is that we have been so much brought up to think about these psychiatric, particularly the psychiatric disorders, but also to some extent neurological disorders, as a unity. 
uh, which it may not be. So, uh, so I think this is, uh, this is what we will see more uh, things like that. We will see more multi-center uh, studies uh, being carried out where we are trying to uh, align our inclusion exclusion criteria. Okay, so, um, oh, yeah, fine. <laughs> but could you already do that with the data that has already been published? Then go the other way around. Yeah, the well, that, so can you do that with published data? That would be wonderful if you could do that because it would save you a lot of money and it would save you a lot of time. Um, I think, um, I'll, I'll get back to that, but what you will see is that the complexity of, uh, of at least of PET imaging data is, is quite high. So you have uh, a number of differences between, that could be, be present between different sites. In fact, we have a, a student working solely on these pipelines at the moment. And, and what you will see is that those pipelines, the pre-processing pipelines of the data, can differ quite substantially from one center to another center. And it may not sound that bad, but in fact, if you want to pool data, that could be a complication. What you could do, of course, is you could say, well, then I put in the center as a covariate, and then I can account for that, and that, that would be one possibility. Um, in my experience, in my limited experience, I think people are not overly interested in sharing uh, their data. They, uh, and, and that actually also not only applies to the scientists, but it also applies to the funding agencies, although they say that they're interested in doing replications, then when you actually submit a grant where you plan to do data sharing, they're not really interested because there's no novelty in this. And, uh, and that's also what some scientists will tell you if you ask them to share their data with you. Now, in my experience, I think the more you work with the data, the more people that see your data, the better you can actually, uh, you know, have identify uh, problems with your data, maybe uh, some data that, uh, I mean, it could be little things like, uh, so we were scanning, this is an exam, we were scanning two 42-year-old uh, women on the same day, and somehow, which should not be, I mean, it shouldn't happen, but it happened nevertheless. Somehow they got their brains swapped so that the MRI was uh, co-registered uh, to the other lady's um, PET scan. And these little things are so easy, it so easily happens, but, uh, then it's only, you know, by somebody actually looking into this again, how can this, how come this looks like this? That was only later that we discovered that had happened and took new measures to make sure that that did not happen again. Yeah. Why is it that we cannot do more than one receptor at a time? Okay, so um, I'll, 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 I'll get back to that. But basically what PET does is it uses uh, a limited number of PET isotopes. Um, it could, the most commonly used is carbon-11 labeled compounds, but you can also use fluoratine labeled compounds. Now, what happens when the positron meets uh, the electron in the brain, uh, you have an annihilation, and that annihilation has the same energy regardless of uh, the radionuclide that you are having. So this means that if you do, if you try to do both things at one time, it's not going to work. So, yeah. It's just a comment to that, but you can do that in preclinical stuff like all the You can do two different because then you have one with a slow um, radioactive decay and one with a fast radioactive decay. So sure. you can see these two different. Yeah. So like, have, like when you can see instantly and when you then will develop over weeks. So you can see that those are differences. But you can't do it with PET imaging. <clears throat> what about doing it on different days? You know, let's have a yeah. Well, you can you can definitely do you can do two or three PET scans in a day if you want to, if your radiochemist is up to speed and you, then and you can convince him that he should do it. You you can certainly do three PET scans in a day, and the radiation dose uh, that you get from three PET scans is less than. Uh, 10 millisievert, which in my country is the limit. I think in the U.S. Uh, the limit is somewhat higher. Um, and, um, and what you get, uh, depending on where you are situated, if, uh, if you are sitting on, a, on a, a, a rock or in a mountain, you get a lot of radioactivity. If you have uh, one of these uh, gold cards, you know, when you 
uh, frequent flyer cards, uh, then you probably also get quite some radiation from exposure um, when you do the flights. So, uh, but generally, uh, three PET scans would correspond to the exposure you get uh, for three years. So you get approximately three uh, to four millisieverts uh, per, um, um, per year, just the natural background. And we don't know much about what's happening at such low exposure. Uh, all we know is that we have some disasters, uh, some from the uh, atomic nuclear um, weapons. Uh, and so we have some data from Hiroshima. And what people generally do is they try to extrapolate from these extremely high levels down to uh, these very, very low background levels. And, uh, who says that this is a linear process? So there are many assumptions in, in how we estimate this. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, uh, actually there are some data uh, that support that a small dose of radiation is actually healthy for you because it keeps your DNA repairing enzymes uh, fit. Um, so uh, this was the part about radioactivity, yes? No, so, so good question. So what you do um, when you do a PET imaging study is to work at tracer doses. So you don't want to do a study that interferes with what you're measuring. And I'll give you some examples uh, of this later on. Uh, I start to think that I should have swapped the, uh, <laughs> the uh, order of the presentations because then, then but I'll, I'll get back to some of these things. So you need to be at tracer doses and we need to make absolutely sure that we are at tracer doses because you do not want to have any pharmacological actions uh, working on them. So even if you give maybe four microgram, that might be too much uh, for some radioligands because you are already there starting to see some pharmacological effects. Okay, uh, then there's the effect of medication. So some of these patients, they are depressed, they're severely depressed. You cannot just take them off medication or uh, maybe you can wait a little bit, but it's very hard. So you also don't know, are you looking at the effects of the medication? Uh, or, and um, another question that you could ask is, so if we see a group difference, what does it mean? Does it mean that this is a healthy, healthy response to uh, a disease? Uh, is it a reactive response or is it part of the pathogenesis? Uh, and then finally, uh, I think another problem that we've um, encountered too is that when you do cross-sectional data acquisitions, that is, you'd study one patient at a time and only once, uh, then we have the whole issue about um, population heterogeneity coming up. If you instead could study the same subject twice and you could have an intervention in between, you would have a much, much better measure of uh, what was happening. Okay, and then uh, another question could still be, so are we looking at trade or are we looking at state? Meaning, if we see a difference, is it because this brain always looked like that? Is that because this is how a depression vulnerable brain looks like? Or is it something that uh, was changed because of the disease? So this is always something that we are a little interested in knowing. And here are some of the susceptibility features of depression. As I mentioned before, certain personality characters um, uh, features are uh, more prone to develop depression. 50% uh, of our personality comes from our genes. Uh, the good news is that we have 50% that belong to ourselves, if you, if you want to express it like that. Uh, we know that there are genotypes, familiar predisposition, um, we can also look at intervention studies and see how the brain reacts to these interventions. Uh, people who have had a depression uh, before are more prone to ha become, have a mood, a depressed mood after an acute tryptophan depletion. We know that there are uh, some environmental stresses and I've listed two here. One is uh, change of season particularly where I come from, from the northern latitudes. Uh, we have a, a lack of daylight uh, in the winter and um, we have a, a large proportion of, uh, uh, of people who have winter blues or regular winter depression. Changes in estrogen levels is also known to uh, elicit uh, very easily depressive symptoms in 
disposed uh, people. So uh, what I'll talk about today would be the seasonality uh, thing. And I think winter depression, uh, okay, before I do that, I'll just show you one thing, which comes back to the personality. And, um, and this is a study where we looked at the serotonin 2A receptor binding in healthy people. And we asked people to respond to a personality questionnaire that you fill in. You just answer a number of different questions, 240 questions. And then your personality can be grouped uh, according to your replies. And uh, one of the big fives is the neuroticism. Uh, and um, the uh, neuroticism trait uh, is determined on the basis of a, some questions that may look like this, for instance. I often feel helpless and want someone else to solve my problems. Then you say, I agree very much, I disagree very much. So you have five different uh, replies you can give back. I often worry about things that can go wrong. I tend to blame myself whenever something goes wrong, etc., etc. So these are features that have been identified uh, and um, are well established uh, in the literature. And, uh, and in this study where we looked at the 5-HT2A receptors, uh, we could see that there was a, a high association. So the higher uh, your 5-HT2A uh, in the uh, frontal limbic region, uh, the more uh, neuroticism, uh, the more people scored on the neuroticism scale. So uh, this could be potentially uh, a uh, susceptibility factor, uh, an association with the 5-HT2A. And uh, it also goes along with some data from other labs that have shown that the pessimistic attitude in depressed individuals is also associated with a higher 2A. And interestingly, um, we are now starting to see some, uh, some new studies uh, and we'll have to see where this goes in the future. But so far we've had three open label, we've seen three open label studies of psilocybin. Uh, and this is a study uh, where they looked at treatment-resistant depression and um, they gave uh, two small doses, first one small dose and a little bit larger dose of psilocybin, which is also from magic mushrooms. Uh, and um, what they reported was that uh, the people who uh, received psilocybin, uh, many of them dropped below uh, this uh, score, this depression score of 30, which, which is where you have a severe depression, and either they um, completely uh, got rid of those depressive symptoms, at least for a while, uh, and, uh, or they uh, got uh, milder, uh, milder symptoms. And some of them slightly, after three months, uh, moved back to their prior depressed state, but uh, I think data like this is also in support of it. The, the way that uh, we would think about it is that perhaps psilocybin, which is a 5-HT2A agonist, uh, is leading to an internalization of the 5-HT2A receptors and that these lower 5-HT2A receptor signaling in uh, the um, frontal limbic regions uh, is associated with uh, less, um, less severe symptoms. And, and if this uh, holds up to uh, larger studies, it will be an interesting way of uh, actually treating uh, with acute uh, interventions. And we wouldn't need to wait for three weeks, uh, as is the case today. Yeah. Uh, just just to, to, to clarify the, the elevated levels of 5 h 2 receptors, do you interpret this as reflecting a lower serotonin? level per se and how do you know? Well, how do you know? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> but, but if you remember the data I showed before based on the animal data, um, if, you have, if you have low, um, it, it could potentially be that explained by low 5, 5 HT uh, in the brain. Uh, so that is hard to, you know, it, what you're suggesting is that maybe it's not specific for 5 ht 2 maybe it could merely be reflecting that we had lower levels of uh, serotonin, and, and I agree, we can't really distinguish between these two. Yeah, there was another question here. So, the direction of causality is the receptor binding, is leading to the depression or the So, there's no way that the causality can be reversed. So, you're talking about the causality, what comes first? Is that? Yes. 
Well, that's, that's, that's a very good question. The question is, what comes first? Do you have your receptor changes first, and then you get this personality? Or do you have the personality, and then your receptors adapt? To me, this is a very hard question to answer, because both personality and receptors um, would be highly genetically driven. So, and we think about personality as something that is very stable across a lifetime. And um, so I would say that I think it would be an integral part of it. And to say what comes first is not, is not that easy, actually. OK, so we'll see where this goes. It's uh, an interesting um, uh, possibility, at least. Um, yeah, uh, then another way to look at it is that we know that depressed individuals have a negative bias. This means that if you see a smiling face, you see a smiling face. If a depressed person sees a smiling face, they think, oh, maybe she wasn't smiling. I think she wasn't, uh, maybe, she did, maybe she dislikes me. Maybe she thinks I'm not performing well. Uh, so this kind of negative bias uh, is something that we very consistently see uh, in people with uh, depressive uh, symptoms, with mood symptoms. Uh, and um, when you show pictures to people in the scanner, um, uh, these are some fearful faces, uh, or you can show angry faces, uh, then the patients or people with uh, depressive symptoms they respond with much higher amygdala reactivity uh, to such uh, images compared to the neutral images. Um, and so this is uh, an imaging paradigm that has been used for quite a while now, and it's quite well established. And um, um, uh, when you look at the interaction between a gene, uh, the, a gene variant, the serotonin transporter, um, promoter variant, uh, which is termed 5-HCTLPR. Uh, we know that this gene comes in two natural variants, and some of you will have uh, the 2S alleles, some will have 2L alleles, and some in this room will have one of each. And uh, it comes in the S version here, uh, which is a short and more inefficient version, and it has a long, more efficiently working um, uh, version. Uh, and what we know is that um, if, if you have the, uh, the short version, you tend to have, uh, as I said, less efficient transporting, which means that uh, you can see that there will be higher serotonin levels, at least when you look at knockout uh, mice and, uh, and, and microdialysis. So uh, there was, in the beginning, uh, we, there were some quite prestigious journals that came out and said that, well, if you have the short version of the 5 HCT LPR gene, uh, you will have a higher uh, activation of amygdala in, um, uh, in those people who are S carriers compared to L carriers. Uh, but then there was this recent uh, meta-analysis uh, where they ended up uh, concluding that the association between the 5 HCT LPR and amygdala activation is smaller than originally thought. Unfortunately, something that we encounter from time to time, that we have a great and very interesting finding, and it sounds very plausible that this is what's going on, but then once you start to investigate it a little bit more, then it may not be quite as convincing as, you, as it looked in the beginning. Uh, but the majority of previous studies have been considered underpowered to therapy, demonstrate an effect of this size. That's what they conclude in this um, large meta-analysis. Um, so, um, now that we know that personality is another uh, vulnerability factor or susceptibility factor for depression, uh, could it be that actually there was an interaction between the genes and uh, the personality? And um, this is a study where we looked at uh, uh, amygdala uh, uh, connectivity between uh, the mesial prefrontal cortex and amygdala. So what happens when you see these fearful faces is your amygdala starts to fire, but your prefrontal, your medial uh, prefrontal cortex tells you, now easy now, easy now, take it easy. And, uh, and this means that if you have a good connectivity between your medial prefrontal cortex and your amygdala, you will have uh, a better ability to suppress uh, uh, your brain response to these images.
And um, what we can see from this slide, which uh, included, uh, I think, almost, was it 100 subjects or so, um, that um, the connectivity uh, uh, in uh, the um, in the S carriers uh, was actually larger uh, than in uh, the L carriers, perhaps because they need to uh, to uh, keep control of their amygdala uh, when they are S carriers. Um, and um, here, what you see is that uh, when you look at the uh, connectivity. Uh, in response uh, or in relation to the level of neuroticism in people, you can see that uh, they actually behave differently uh, depending on their genotype. So most likely we need to be a little bit more sophisticated when we do some of these analysis and a single uh, gene variant is not enough for us to tease out some of these uh, associations. Question. Yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, could you explain how to measure functional connectivity? Yeah, yeah. Functional connectivity is um, so when you do uh, the the paradigm and you're in the scanner, then again you have activity going on. Uh, I, I talked about before about resting state connectivity, and it's kind of the same thing that you look at uh, the oscillations going on in both regions. So what you do is you put a seed in your uh, region of interest, in this case amygdala, and then you look at across the entire brain, you look at uh, what, how, what, what, what brain regions are in synchrony uh, with uh, the amygdala in this case. Yeah? Another fucking question. The reason for doing this is basically to find, uh, when we can find a marker that's predictive of development of depression, correct? Um, I would say these are healthy people. So, um, so the idea was not really to say that we would like to identify, well, you could say it would be to identify, to identify features for susceptibility. Is that what you said? Yes. Sorry, yeah. That's, yeah. But if you already, but you can't possibly, let's say you find that, you can't possibly scan it uh, with that relation. So you will find people that are susceptible already. So are you, scared, are you already find, are scanning people that are already susceptible to find out whether they're susceptible? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're touching on something that sort of, that is interesting because you are asking basically for the clinical relevance. So what can, how can we use this piece of information practically when we see patients? Um, but the way I see it is that uh, unless we know the neurobiology between all these measures that we have when we study uh, this disorder, uh, there's no way that we can actually get to know more about this disease. So it's more like a basic uh, science thing to do these things, just like many of us do basic things that may not be uh, entirely applicable. Uh, then, you know, it's still interesting to know that now you can't just take uh, a blood sample and determine the genotype and say that your risk is so and your risk is so, because it depends. I mean, it depends if you also have uh, high neuroticism, then you know you, you probably need to have more factors, and it comes back to this biomarker thing. So what we always would like to have would be a biomarker, so that we can uh, identify a psychiatric disorder, and we can follow that biomarker to see if it changes with, um, for instance, with interventions or something like that. So uh, I think we've. I think the hope that you can identify one single biomarker that tells you this is the test for depression, I think that is not a realistic um, perspective. I think we will most likely will end up with a mixture of different, um, uh, of different measures that need to be combined in some kind of algorithm. I think there are a lot of questions. So you have one? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, uh, for instance, if you are an S carrier, um, are you more likely, or, or vice versa, or are you more likely to respond to, um, to SSRIs? I think there have been made some pretty large studies on that, suggesting that, if I remember correctly, don't, 
I think one of, I'm, I'm just a little bit in doubt now which genotype they found, and, and I'm not sure if it has been replicated. I think it said that it was the S carriers, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Yep. Was another question here? Uh, I just wonder if you have looked at the same person during at the, at the placebo state and then after. Yeah, I have, and I'll show you the data now. Let's just drop to that. So seasonal affective disorder is a beautiful model for depression because in the summer you get rid of all your symptoms, uh, you're just fine, and um, then uh, when uh, the days start to become shorter uh, and the daylight uh, is more limited, um, you see uh, that people develop uh, winter depression and for instance, in Copenhagen, which is at a latitude of about 55 degrees, we have uh, approximately 5% of uh, people in Copenhagen um, suffer from winter depression. Uh, and if you look at this map, I think it's interesting, you can actually tell that the frequency of uh, winter depression uh, increases as you go more north. Um, so uh, it's a beautiful model. Why do I think it's a beautiful model? Because you can actually reinvestigate people uh, when they recover. And, um, and seasonal affective disorder is uh, also a disorder uh, that meets the criteria for depression, but it just has some additional specific features that make us think that maybe it's not. It is, it is something special because you also have some features such as uh, carbohydrate craving, you sleep much more. Uh, so it has certain features that are not quite as, uh, as characteristic. Uh, we call them atypical symptoms. So, um, so this is a study that uh, my former PhD student, Brenda McMahon, did. And uh, what we did first was to do the screening and the SPAC, which is a kind of a questionnaire where you can find on the internet if you think that you might suffer from winter blues, you can go and you can respond to that and you can see if you score high enough. Um, and um, we also did genotyping because we knew from previous studies that the 5-HTTLPR seems to fluctuate differently across seasons. So we made sure that we genotyped all the individuals and we included only S carriers uh, in our study. And this comes back to the discussion we had before do we want to be very specific and look for a certain signal in a subgroup of patients, or do we want to generalize? But in this case, we wanted to be able to capture the signal, so we went for the, uh, the uh, S carriers only. We included both men and women, and they were uh, randomly uh, initiated in the program, either in the summer or in the winter. So some uh, SAD patients, um, seasonal affective disorder patients, uh, they were included while they were depressed, others uh, in the summer. And some of those we included in the summer did not get depression, so, but that's what happens. But you need to balance your design in this way. So they went through a serotonin transporter binding, uh, PET scan, uh, we did baseline fMRI with uh, different um, paradigms. They were new psychologically tested, uh, and we did trade and state questionnaires that we always run together with our PET scan. So we have a certain set of questionnaires that people fill in online and it's automatically extracted, so we store that in our database. And you can ask the question, how well, um, how much can you rely on a self-questionnaire? I mean, if you ask people to describe their own personality, are they not going to be kind of overly, you know, positive about themselves? But that's actually not the case. And it's, it's known that when you, for instance, ask uh, spouses to uh, describe um, the person under investigation, uh, then actually there is a quite good concordance between what uh, near family members report about the person and the person's own uh, self-questionnaire. So it, it seems to be uh, pretty reliable. Now obviously if you ask a person uh, and ask them to fill in a personality questionnaire, while they're depressed, what do you think? Do you think they're going to respond the same way to the questionnaire as compared to when they're not depressed? What do you think? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so what you do when you fill in the question is, is you, you have these five choices and you get a statement that I, like I showed you before and you respond to that statement. For instance, it could be, uh, I'm always worried about, I always worry about things. Now, you reply between, you know, one and five, I never worry about things, I always worry about things, or something in between. And how do people, re how do you think people would respond if, if they are depressed to such a questionnaire? Do you think they would respond the same as, uh, in, as in the situation when they were not depressed? Yeah? Uh, I guess that But let's say, let's say you don't have a new psychological test. Let's say that you only have this questionnaire about personality and, and you ask people to respond. Yeah? Isn't that interesting how it takes time? Because you have the sentence in there like every question is like I respond every day or like all the time in practice or like sad. Well, we don't ask about these things. We more ask about uh, things like uh, so um, you remember the questions I showed before. So it's more like, you know, how do I behave? So in a given situation, how would I behave? And what you do, it's actually, you should always fill in these questionnaires yourself. And it's actually interesting to do because you learn a lot about how it works. And, and the way it works is really, you think about yourself in relation to other people. And what you typically do is to say, well, I'm not, you know, if I compare myself to other people, then I'm probably not so worried uh, or something like that. So, I mean, that's how they respond. So, so in the situation when they're depressed, I told you they were having a negative bias. So would you think that they would respond the same way? I'll, I'll just like to get the answer now. Maybe like they would be more negative about something? Yes, exactly. So they're also more negative about how they perceive themselves. They perceive themselves as more worried because right now, that's how they feel about themselves. So, so when you respond to a questionnaire, it is also to some extent state um, dependent. So that's just my point that we could see that this was clearly the case. Uh, so just like they would respond with a negative bias to the new psychological uh, examinations, they would also respond with a negative bias to themselves and how they perceive themselves. Remember, if you're depressed, you perceive yourself as a really bad person. Nobody likes you. Yeah, you can, you, of course you can do things like that and, and, and I think they will give you a fairly good response uh, to that. Um, but it, this is more, I mean, the personality questionnaires are more like uh, a state measure. We think we're measuring a state because we believe it's something that's fairly stable across, the, and it is, I mean, it is quite stable, but if, you're, if you are not healthy and you're sick, then you respond differently. So that was uh, so. That's one of the things. Were there more questions? Okay. Um, yeah. What about how does the severity affect uh, this pattern of like, feeling of itself being negative? Like, oh, it it's definitely related to the symptoms, the negative bias. Yeah. So so I mean, to the extent that um, I mean, suicide is probably the ultimate negative bias you can have, and and some people get so depressed that they want to kill themselves because they are not worth of living and nobody likes them and the world would be a better place without them. That's how they think about it. And uh, so it's, it's actually a terrible situation to be in. Yeah. Is suicide, uh, thought, suicidal thought less prevalent in winter depression compared to uh, other types of depression? Um, Is no, that? yeah. I, mm, well, I think it has more to do with the severity, and uh, if, if you have a very severe depression, then suicide uh, is more likely to occur. Uh, and, and I think what we found here was, of course, we were very interested that they did not receive any medication, and we could also persuade them not to use bright light therapy, because that's what you could do. You can get a lamp and you can sit in the morning, and that has been shown to be quite efficient also as efficient as SSRI intervention. But, um, and, and we actually met some questions from the reviewers when we submitted the paper, saying how come that you, know, that you could actually manage to have such depressed people 
uh, not being on medication. And, and I think it's because that these people had encountered their seasonality before. They knew this was going to be temporary. They knew that when summer would, when the daylight came back, they, they would be, you know, they would be fine again. So they, they can sustain that. I mean, having that knowledge, I think, is quite important. But if you are severely depressed, no matter uh, what kind of depression, then uh, suicide is more likely to occur. This is my favorite question. Does suicide require large amounts of motivation? Uh, I mean, yeah. If you're severely, severely depressed, yeah. You yeah, if you're completely catatonic, so to speak, yeah, then uh, of course you can't really have the energy. That's why we always learned back in medical school that the moment that you start to treat people with whatever therapy you, you choose, um, it could be uh, ECT or it could be uh, tricyclic antidepressants or SSRIs, it's actually the most dangerous period because they get enough energy to do what they have been thinking about doing all the time and to do the planning and so on. Yeah. I just want to make a distinction. I mean, the people who suffer from the depression is, doesn't usually tend to uh, suicide. The only people who suffer from a major depression, depression is usually tend to uh, suicide. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, I don't, so, so I, I, what do you mean metabolic? Uh, I don't know, maybe um, problems with reuptake, uh, problems with uptake of certain... Oh, okay, yeah, if that's what you mean by, yeah. Oh, oh I'm going to show you the results uh, soon, but I'm um, just, okay. Are there more questions? Okay, I've got, I've got one question. Yes, sure. Let's see whether we can get some um, conclusions here. So, is negative bias? A, a possible candidate for trait partner, number one. And number two, is negative bias the same as anhedonia? It seems to be assumed by quite a few preclinical investigators. Or is it something that's different? Well, uh, I think, yes, I think it is a trait. So negative bias is a trait that's specific. And the question whether anhedonia is the same as negative bias, I don't think so. Uh, uh, and uh, and, and it's, it's very distinct uh, entities, actually, because uh, negative bias is how you perceive things. Anhedonia is more that you don't care. So, so it's, it's really two different um, traits. Okay, um, so, um, so they were investigated, we, there was a change of season, they were reinvestigated here with all these different tests. And what did we find? Well, what you see here is that when you looked in the summer, uh, the serotonin transporter binding across the brain uh, tended, uh, was actually the same in people uh, without uh, SAD and SAD individuals. However, what we found a little surprisingly is that uh, as um, winter emerged, we could see that the, um, uh, the uh, seasonal affective disorders did not statistically differ from uh, their own group, whereas uh, the resilient people, these were, these were actually resilient people, they uh, had a downregulation, meaning that perhaps they would encounter, they would, inc they would compensate for the environmental stress of the winter, by uh, downregulating their serotonin transporter. And moreover, um, when you looked at the change across season, you could see that uh, the more the SAD individuals failed to downregulate uh, their serotonin transporter, uh, uh, the more depressive symptoms they had. So there was a direct association between how well were they actually able to adjust uh, to uh, the new condition, the environmental stressor, uh, and uh, to, um, uh, to, this, um, uh, um, to, to the severity. And, and very nicely, I talked before about how to replicate uh, studies. And, and at the same time, there was uh, a different group here from Toronto who actually found the exact same thing. Um, 
So that's always very nice. So um, I don't know. Is it coffee now? And then we'll go back to the question.